you. Good to see you all. We'll be starting shortly. Just wanted to give you a couple of um, information items. If you want to have a coffee, feel free to grab one. We're going to be keeping the breakfast up until um, after the break. Uh, we'll start soon. There are ladies and gentlemen's bathrooms to the back to your right. Um, the exit is only where you came in. You can go down by the stairs or the elevator. Um, and we'll be having q and after each one of the sessions. It's cool and the air conditioning will stay on all day. It's very hot outside. So it's welcome, a nice air conditioning. The more people we are, the cooler the air conditioning will get, I think. But it will be pleasant all day. Before we start off, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Pardon me? What's the Wi-Fi? There's the guest Wi-Fi for Linia Pegna. It's open, there's no code. That's correct. Good question. Yeah, the pleasure. Program. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to have time for questions as the program goes on. We have some great panelists for you to listen to today. Uh, before we begin introducing the speakers, I want to first of all thank uh, the sponsors uh, you'll hear from in just a few minutes for their support. I want to thank the panelists for the time and effort they've put into developing the presentations you're going to hear today. And I especially want to thank Yunich and Lindy Pelle for the work that they've done in organizing this program. We couldn't have done this without them. We're the host for the program, but all the hard work to get this program up and running today was done by Lindy Pelle, Yunich, and their staff. And please give me a roll. Sorry, 
past chair of Leather Industries of America, and the first female that's had the honor to serve as the president of International Council of Tanners. On behalf of us, I'm really proud of the program that Lenny and Pelly and Unich and John and Steve have been able to put together, and I hope that you all enjoy it as well. I would like to thank John, President of LIA, and Steve with U.S. Hides Gibbons Leather, and our friends and family with Unit and Lenny and Pelly, and they did all the work. Um, I'm just uh, giving the speech. So thank you guys very, very much, very much. So I hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you very much for coming. Please, please, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, we don't want anybody to leave here not understanding the beauty and the sophistication and the quality that leather brings to any product. Thank you very much. We are here in New York to change. Inapelle has chosen to actively collaborate with the organization of the fourth edition of the World Other Congress in order to find a new paradigm of communication and promotion for leather and for the tanning industry. We are all aware of the urgent need for a new voice to demonstrate and share the excellence, the sustainability, and the quality of the product made by the industry we represent. Leather has always been considered an amazing material, with matchless capacities in terms of conveying emotions, stimulating creativity, and delivering high durability performance. Everybody has only been aware about that. Our industry, our clients, our, customers, our consumers. There was also no particular need to push on this side because these values were widely recognized. But the world is changing fast. People are more and more connected. The circulation of information has become easier and easier, and communication, thanks to the internet and the social media mainly, more and more massive. It is a big success for human society, no doubt about it. But the big success has also brought some new problems. Sometimes op opinions have substituted science. Perception and reality often seem to follow divergent paths. Superficiality clashes against education and knowledge. And in this context, also the leather and timing industry is sometimes attacked by
by paradoxical and misleading accusations. We don't have to feel frustrated about that. We need to tackle this challenge and strongly increase our commitment to communicate the great values of our industry at 360 degrees. This is the spirit that has led us to this world of the Congress, but also the spirit that pervades the lobbying activities developed together with ICT and COTANS at the international level and the collaboration with initiatives like Leather Natural. If our group has also been developing for years a wide range of international workshops, roadshows, seminars, training courses directed to clients, designers, stakeholders and students from the most prestigious fashion institutes, our most recent initiative is a communication project developed with an international specialized agency with the objective of dismantling the false prejudices against leather. All these initiatives led us face to face with the theme of the World Leather Congress, which does not intend to only celebrate the role played by leather in our everyday life, but rather exerts the dimension, its dimension as a material that man has always brought with him. A material that has no alternatives because only leather is better than leather. Thank you and enjoy the Congress.
and in particular the younger consumers and designers. This was on the basis that the main present challenge of the industry is to explain to current and future consumers the nature, properties and sustainability credentials of leather as a material. So instead of talking to itself and its suppliers and commercial customers, the priority this time is to tell the story of leather to the consumers and designers of the future. Thank you for coming everyone and enjoy. <laughs>
Jones. Uh, we started some years ago here, so we remember the Pan American Leather Band, which was on for uh, six years in Miami. Wow, that was fantastic. What a, what a party that was. And people got together. <laughs> um, we're all here also for a, for a very serious purpose in terms of how we're going to change uh, people's perception of leather. Um, I've been involved with many of you here in the Leather Naturally uh, position and the process going forward from, from day one. Uh, and I'm very uh, proud uh, to be part of the council for uh, putting together uh, positions in terms of how best to introduce people to leather. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, the, today and also for Linear Pele coming up over the next two days in terms of of discussion, and it's so nice to see lots of young people here, and hopefully on designers, and to be able to utilize, utilize leather for the future. Um, so I'm not going to read any of my speech. <laughs> so, I think I've spoken enough, but I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, to be here, and thank you so much, uh, John and Steve and Lisa, for uh, operations here, and also for my dear friends from, from Munich, uh, Luca, and uh, the team from uh, Many thanks and have a wonderful uh, congress today. Thank you.
they would choose a winner, and the winner would be announced at the end of the event, soon after the last panel of speakers. So I hope to see this afternoon for uh, the winner announcement. And have a good conference. See you later. Thank you. Steve also works with the University of Cincinnati School of Design, uh, educating the students there about leather and its properties. He's an expert in leather science, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve now. I'm sure you will enjoy his presentation. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, John. Uh, when I was first uh, challenged to present to you guys. I was told I had 20 minutes, and now I just found out I have 15 minutes. <laughs> so, and of course the problem is, you know, trying to, trying to cover everything about leather in 20 minutes is very, very tough. Uh, so, we start with, does leather really come from cows? And what I, what I hope to convey to you is, is a basic understanding of how leather is made and some different terms that we can be used to define leather. So without further ado, where does leather come from? Most leather comes from these four animals. Uh, cows, pigs, sheep, and goats. Very, very simple, very, very basic. The, uh, leather is a byproduct of the food industry. Obviously, that has already been said many times uh, today already. And uh, no animal is killed for its hide or its skin, like leather. And converting raw hides and leather into leather obviously saves a huge load from the uh, landfills. I think in the uh, beef industry, the U.S. does, what, 30 million a year. If you took 30 million hides every year and you put into a landfill, the, the human health hazard of that would be tremendous. So obviously you don't want to do that. <coughs> um, and leather is a durable and versatile material. Lisa pointed out before how you can take something from the same animal and just the little different subtleties in the chemistry, you can make a, a baseball leather, to, uh, you know, it's very tinny, very, very tight, doesn't, doesn't include or cause the bulbs to have more home runs, right? <laughs> and that's not going on now because of the leather. But you can go from an a, a Allen can, cowhide, baseball leather, all the way to the bullshit leather, or to the love leather. Same, same basic material. Which I think is really pretty, pretty awesome. Meat processors, where they, uh, obviously where the meat butter comes from. Uh, some tan the hides on site, and others preserve them for transport, but basically it's a global industry now. The hides are created globally, you will have a lot of hides from the U.S. going to foreign countries, Italy, uh, Vietnam, China, all over the world, basically. The tanner 
process, there's, a, there's a, the, the first stage of the tannery uh, goes into the beam house. Um, the, uh, the name of the beam house came from the, the name of the actual, uh, one of the actual uh, pieces of equipment in the very beginning. Uh, basically, it's four different processes, soaking, unhearing, buffing, and uh, pickling. It's all controlled by pH. Does everyone remember what pH is all about from your high school chemistry class? You know, you got acid versus base. That, that all works in, uh, in the tannery. When I first started with uh, leather, I met our tanner, at, uh, and he was from the, the Ukraine, and he didn't really believe the pH meters. He always liked to taste things to make sure that it was really acid or it was really base. Uh, it, it took a while, but we did convince him that the meter is right. It really is right. <laughs> But it is getting kind of greenish tones. I don't quite know why. But soaking is a first process. The raw hides would come into the tannery. It would be uh, soaked in water, basically, and you're removing any kind of dung and dirt, any kind of blood that's in the hides. Uh, and you notice this picture here is a wooden, wooden vessel, and it looks very primitive, very old. But actually, that is a very good thing to do because a wooden drum in this particular application lasts longer than a metal or a plastic one would. So this drum is probably like 60 or 70 years old. And you know, it, it forms an equilibrium with the solution and away you go. So it works out very well. After the soaking, it goes into an unhairing. And this operation, like I said, is pH driven. It's very high pH in the 12 uh, pH range uh, using lime and sodium sulfide. And as you can see, they're using a cement mixer formula. Here. This is an operation that uses less water than the previous version. Uh, one thing I'd like to convey is that all the tanners in the world are trying to do more with less. They're trying to use more efficient chemistry, more efficient mechanical processes. And this, uh, the cement mixer is one of those. Baiting and pickling is a very simple step. It uh, uses the enzymes to clean up the, uh, the hide, the leather itself. So it's using a naturally occurring uh, organism to uh, improve the leather uh, surface, and salts are, are used to lower the, the uh, pH of the, uh, of the, of the hide. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the leather structure itself is a fiber system, and it's a, it's a very complicated uh, network. You can't change things very quickly because of that. It's a very slow process. Splitting is done at this stage, lime splits. And uh, in this case, the leather is, uh, there's a lot of variation on how thick it may be, but a bovine hide may be about five or seven millimeters thick. If you want to come up with a, uh, an upholstery leather at 1.2 millimeters thick, you have to split it at some point. And at the lime stage, is a real thick uh, stage to do it. Cutting is easy and precise. If you consider a wet hide being easy to cut, it is easy to cut in this stage. And actually, the leather comes out a little bit softer. And the bottom part can be used for other things. It can be used for sausage casings, dog chews, gummy bears, that kind of thing. Collagen, it's a source of collagen. This also saves process chemicals and reduces waste off. To give you an idea of what it looks like, we have the top of grain, this would be where the hair is uh, high, and versus the, uh, the what we call the flesh side. And this, uh, you can get the full grain, cut grain a new buck out of here and you get the suede and mill slits and finish slits down below. That gives the idea that it's the splitting. This is done on a uh, horizontal bandsaw type arrangement with a uh, razor blade basically cutting the hide. Tanning is uh, obviously the next stage. Uh, 90 to 95 percent of the world's leather is tanned in chrome. Uh, the rest of it is finished tan. Uh, tanning is by a chromium sulfide, sulfate, which there's a chemistry. And the chrome 3 is the uh, active agent in the, uh, the tan. I was told not to do a whole lot of science. <laughs> so that's as, that's, as, that's as raw as we get. But basically, the chrome molecule is forming a ladder with the collagen molecules. So you're getting a ladder chain to, to, to stabilize the collagen fibers to prevent them from degrading. And that, uh, that works very, very effectively. And chrome is probably one of the fastest and, and most stable forms of uh, tan. Uh, as I said, the pH is, uh, is a driver for this whole thing. Remember, we, were, we did the line split, 
the hive is up here in the 12 range, you had to bring it all the way down to 3 to actually start the pH. It's very, very uh, in, uh, important to control the penetration of how it goes. At the end of the tanning process, for chrome leather, you have uh, wet material like this, and it is called wet glue actually. And uh, there's minimal chrome in the water, and most of it is in the leather itself. Chemical manufacturers in the leather industry and the tanners themselves have been working very, very diligently to make the tanning process as efficient as possible. But all the chrome that you offer the hides, they, they all go in the hides, and there's very little the wastewater. I was going to talk about just chrome and bench tanning, but I think oil tanning is a very cool thing. Chamois leather is, is very cool. It's a totally different process as far as the tanning goes. It's done in the uh, like a pressure kind of type cooker, and it uses the fish oil. But the thing is, it gives you it allows the leather to absorb 600% of its weight, and it dries to 180% and stays nice and soft and has no grease to it. And I like to consider it nature's microfiber. We hear more and more in the news about how microfibers are getting into our wastewater, into our our, our, our water streams, and you know, it'll last forever. But on the high, on the, on the side of uh, the chamois, if it gets into the water, it will eventually degrade because it's so only oil tanned. It's just been out. And the oil is actually a fish, fish oil, so it's a very natural product. And if you ever get a lot of fingerprints on your uh, cell phone, get a chamois. It cleans it up real nice. <laughs> real nice. And dry soft. I like the all right, veg tanning is the other big uh, operation uh, for tanning. Uh, knees and pods and bark, they can be uh, from any, any kind of thing. Uh, tower trees, uh, ratio, oak, you name it, it can be used in tanning. This tanning is done in different types of uh, vessels. These are a um, more of a static vessel, a pit of some kind. It's a very uh, large vessel, and it's a very slow process. very time intensive. If you look at the, uh, the process time for like chrome tanning, it may take about uh, eight hours or a little bit more than eight hours. Uh, bench tanning can take up to a month or more. So it's a very, very different process. There's a comparison. I've got to do a little comparison to tell you the advantages and disadvantages of uh, bench versus chrome tan. Uh, bench tan leather is very hydrophobic or hydrophilic. hydrophilic. So it uh, absorbs a lot of the water, very much so, whereas the uh, chrome tan is hydro more hydrophobic. Uh, remember, this is not, well, we'll get into later how you can customize things, but uh, edge tan is uh, a little bit more flame resistant than chrome tan. The chrome tan, you can have a little afterglow. Uh, generally, what we find in the laboratory is if any application requires flame resistance, it's usually like aircraft leather or uh, very high uh, uh, firefighter gloves or fuel handler gloves for the uh, military, but like automotive leather, it doesn't need any additives to pass uh, the flame requirements in that application. Um, veg tan has a lower shrink temperature than chrome tan. Chrome tan will shrink at 100 degrees centigrade or, or so, whereas veg tan probably is more like 70, 70 degrees. So if you need a uh, high shrink resistant type leather, chrome is the way to go for that. If you, uh, veg tan leather is firmer, low, in, low elongation and low elasticity, whereas the uh, chrome tan is a softer, higher elongation and more elasticity, a little bit more rubbery. And uh, veg tan obviously does good tooling and uh, good embossing, and uh, chrome tan by itself is not uh, very good for that. Uh, leather is generally a very good uh, insulated material when it comes to uh, gloves. Uh, the bench tan is a little bit uh, lower thermal conductivity, so it's a little bit uh, better insulator than the chrome. But uh, we've done some studies in the lab trying to change the thermal characteristics of leather, and we weren't able to actually get anything quantitatively different, but some people had, uh, they were sitting on the seats and they, they subjectively felt that uh, one was better than the other. But uh, couldn't really so, at the end, we're, we're still at the wet blue stage, wet white stage. Wet white is the uh, veg tan, uh, uh, tan in this process. 
the next processes would be the shading, retain, coloring, and palette grain. Shading is again trying to come up with the right thickness. One of the things, if you want a leather that is only one millimeter thick at the very end, you have to adjust the splitting and the shading way up in your process to get to that end. It's, it's a whole, whole uh, coordinated process. The next stage would be retain coloring and palette cream. Uh, this is a uh, process that's usually done all at one time in one vessel, and like a, like a continuous sequence. Um, in the retan, you can do uh, combination tanning. Coloring is where you want to get the final color of your end product. It, you start to get it that way. Remember, it was white blue before, so you're coming to what kind of color you're looking for. And also, you took all the fat, like the fats out of the hide in the beanhouse process. You stripped them all out and you put them back in. Because if you don't have enough fat liquors in there, you're, the, oil, the, the fibers themselves are not going to uh, slide, they're going to break. So you're going to have a weaker leather. And it won't be as flexible. This though, in the retan operation, you can get really customized with this. You can do things like you can make it waterproof. You can change the, uh, the, the cold characteristics of it and make the water just run right off the hide. Which would make it makes a very nice food. <laughs> and you can also make uh, a little pull up type leather. This, I, I couldn't get a, a, a good image of this, but this is basically where you take a leather and you put some pressure on it underneath, that will change the color, will move the oils around, and make it a little bit lighter than that where you put it under pressure. But if you relax it, it will eventually go like that. And you can also do uh, deep embossing. As I said before, pro tan leather is very rubbery. It doesn't uh, hold anything. But if you want to have a product that, is, that has a deep embossing, you put a little bit of veg tan material in the retan operation, and that way you get the, the high shrink temperature of the chrome, and you also get the embossing properties of the veg tan. So you can get, you can, you can customize and make it more accurate for what you're trying to do. And obviously, you can optimize the, uh, the haptics of it and give you a nice round hand of leather or a very flat hand of leather, depending on what, uh, what you're looking for. If you're looking at something like uh, baseball leather, it's going to be a very flat, very tinny type of a, of a hand versus a garment leather, but you're going to have a nice round hand, nice and nice soft. And that's all done in the, uh, the retan and the, the fat cream stages. Further processes in the tanner, you're talking about drying, softening, and finishing. Drying is not just a simple oven anymore. It's a very complicated process. Uh, toggle drying is a very popular option for this. This is where the hive is put on a, a toggle frame, a frame, and it's subject to some stretch. And you can see here in the image, it's a, uh, it's a long process. This, you know, this would be the hive going in, and it's a whole product, four or five chambers. You want to go very slow with that. You don't want to dry it very fast because you'll have some problems with uh, uh, mortar hardness and, and stiffness when they get stiff. The other, uh, the other main uh, drying option is vacuum drying. This is basically putting the hive between vacuum plates and exposing it to a vacuum to suck the water out. This actually gives you a little bit more um, a softer leather, softer hand of the leather, um, which is always everyone wants. Some leathers are more applicable for air drying. If you have a, uh, a heavy vegetable tan leather or something like that, you might have an air drying. Air drying is uh, another option. Again, it depends on your final product that you're trying to, to shoot for. Softening computer, uh, computer controlled drums now. Uh, these, these can be uh, cycled however you need. You can add moisture to them, you can add perfumes to them, whatever kind of that addition you need to make. And that's uh, basically the end of the wet end process. At this point, you have uh, what's called crust or uh, russet, depending on which, which term you want to use. But the leather has been fully tanned, it's been colored, it's been retanned and retanned in fat, in fat, in fat liquor, so it's basically ready for finishing. Finishing, there's a tremendous level, tremendous level of variation available. It's uh, obviously driven by the end, end, unit, end unit requirements. Some leathers are highly finished, while others are native. Finishing, if you go into a finishing operation today, you'll see something that's very, very well organized and very clean because anytime you do any kind of a finishing, any dirt is going to be a detriment to your final product. So you keep them very clean and very well organized. There's also a great deal of uh, automation in the, in the uh, leather handling, too. Um, leather itself presents quite a challenge to uh, automation because it's not always the same shape, it's not always square, it's not always round. So you have to have the automation that can handle that kind of variation. And the finishing lines, again, it depends on what kind of leather you're making. Uh, this is a spray machine, and it uh, is a, a spraying operation. Spray boot here, spray boot here, oven 
uh, rotary springs, uh, sugar fill spring, and you can also do a roll called roll coder, which is like a, you can just put it on the roll, kind of like a printing press type thing. Again, this is an operation that gets very efficient, twice as far as uh, there's no overspray on roll coders, and the application is recyclable, so it works, it works out very well. The, um, the, the latest technology from the machine manufacturers is trying to make it so you can control the application on roll coders as precise as you can with the spray. Uh, and I think maybe like about five years ago, uh, the roll coders really could only do base coating because they weren't very accurate, and you had to rely on a spray coater to do the uh, final top coat. Uh, now I think you can, you can do top coating even with the uh, roll coder. So that, what that does for the um, tanner is it makes the less Less emissions, less air emissions, less waste because you don't have any overspray. So again, it's trying to be more environmentally friendly. Now I want to uh, define some of the finished types. You hear a lot of uh, different things about full grain versus aniline versus semi-aniline and pigmented. And I'm trying to give you a little bit of an idea of, of what each one is. Aniline leather is leather that has been dyed by immersion and it has not received any coatings of the pigments at all. So the finish is very, very transparent. You can see the air follicles through the finish. And I think this, this
uh, calorie passes resistance than dyes, so you will be able to do that. And uh, your durability will be better because you've got the, uh, the pigments to, to help protect it and you use a high, heavier finish to uh, give you more protection too. And the lower cost, obviously the lower cost is talking about the uh, uh, utilization of the hides itself because you can be able to use more because it's covered in it. And you can do embossing and printing with uh, thinner leather a lot, uh, a lot better than the other types. The trade-offs obviously is the aesthetics. The handle and the feel is not as good. And the depth of perception, when you get, look at the depth of uh, the, the article, it's a little bit harder to achieve like that. And it's, it's not as good an image as it, uh, as it would be. You look in the automotive world, uh, a, a vehicle that has a, a more rustic appeal. I'm thinking of the Ford uh, um, King Ranch vehicles. Those were like an Allen type finish. That had a little bit more appeal than a fully finished uh, pigment and leather on the, on the Ford. Top grain versus full grain leather. That question comes up a lot to the laboratory. Everyone wants to know what's the difference between top grain and full grain. Remember, we're talking about leather, it's a 3D uh, matrix of collagen fibers, and most people agree that the beauty of the leather comes from the grain itself, because that's the very top grain. To repeat where we were, this is the, the, what we're talking about. The grain is the top where the hair is, and you get down below here, you get a little split. So, what do we mean by top grain versus whole grain? Like most people, if you Google it, if you Google what is, uh, you know, Top grain versus, uh, what is the difference between top grain and full grain leather? This is the definition that Google comes up with uh, last week. And uh, they're saying top grain leather is similar to full grain leather, except that the top couple millimeters have been sanded and buffed to take away imperfections. That is actually wrong. <laughs> totally wrong. And I know, I don't know about you, but I kind of do rely on Google for some things. This is kind of, I mean, this, this was number one issue. Number one, answer on Google. <laughs> what it is, the full grain is basically a leather bearing original grain surface with nothing has been removed by buffing, snuffing, or splitting. It's totally intact. Nothing has been removed. That is full grain. That's the official definition. The top grain is referring to that grain split at the top of the hide. It's not talking about the, uh, anything else. It's just talking about the top. The top Google result saying the top couple of millimeters have been sanded and buffed to weigh any perfections. That's actually defining corrective grain leather, which is totally different. Totally different from that. Correct the leather is basically when you have the leathers been partially removed by buffing to a depth covered by whatever kind of uh, defects you're trying to cover. This is done on the buffing machine, and it's basically a giant machine with rollers covered with uh, sandpaper. You're basically sanding the leather. That's cool. Yeah, sanding the leather, sanding the belts, and then full hide. Does anyone recognize that machine? It's very old. It's very old. It's very old. Well, and, and that's really kind of the beauty of the, the, the machinery in the tannery. They, it can be very old because it can last a long time. Yes. <laughs> we won't learn. You should, yeah, we won't learn. <laughs> anyway, correct your leather. If you look at different levels of, levels of correction, you may hear people talk about it's not corrected at all, or it's only snuff, or it's only buff. Well, there, there's the, like, I've got uh, three examples of, of different degrees of buffing. Snuff is where you just take a light, light sanding off to take the little high points off, and uh, you get into more buff, it's a little bit deeper, and you do a heavy buff, you're just grinding it off the way. And of course, you've got to remember that the leather itself has got different thicknesses throughout the hide itself. So if you, if you try to take a little bit off of one area, you may take a little bit more off of another area or nothing off of some areas. So it's going to be a variation. So any kind of a control to this product is going to have to be a visual control to your operators. And embossing. I think you can see in the show next door here and probably uh, tomorrow in the LA, all the different kinds of embossings that can be done. You can emboss with a plate depending on what kind of uh, look you're going for or a roll depending on the look and the volume. Um, there's, there's, there's all kinds of variations. If you do specialty finishes, you can make a suede. Remember the suede is from the, one of the movable splits? 
Whereas the new buck is from the grain, you have the grain surface, but the grain surface is buffed enough to leave a nice, uh, nice nap. Make a new buck. And you get into other specialty finishes like two tones, antiques, uh, other spoils, uh, tipping. Uh, this, this is actually a, a leather that was heavily embossed. And then it was, it was about, first of all, it was sprayed to give you a base, cut, base color. And then it was embossed to raise those, uh, those knob, knobs up. And then the, it was tipped with a roll cutter to give it a little bit of color. And that's to make it look like ostrich leather. It's actually cow hydro. But if you want to make something that looks like ostrich, but don't pay for ostrich, there you go. <laughs> it can be done. Genuine leather, unmatched or really in beauty. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot of in the laboratory, we get a lot of people, consumers, that uh, they call us, they bought a couch, they bought an article, and it's peeling off, it's, it's coming apart, they don't understand why, and the problem is it's not genuine leather. It is synthetic leather, and someone sold them, they told them it's silicone leather or silicon, synthetic leather of some kind. They thought they were getting the benefits of leather, but they were actually not. They were getting something else. And uh, obviously it comes right apart. I think it's already been said before about the incredible diversity of the applications of uh, leather. It, uh, it truly is amazing how much uh, this industry can, can use leather for. And when, I think there's near limitless potential. Any questions? I don't know if I have time for questions. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. Go back a long way in time and use 
start to recognize that uh, there was a time when there was a very little other material that society had um, if it didn't have caves and trees for shelter, um, if it didn't have uh, wood from canoes or boats. Uh, suddenly, the only sizable pieces of material uh, that uh, people uh, had were hides and skins. And, and even if you come a lot forward to the founding time of New York, why is New York here? New York began as a trading place for hides and skins, uh, being shipped uh, mostly to Europe but all over the world uh, from here. Um, and uh, being here in New York for someone like me is pretty fascinating. Um, because um, not only was it when it began a big trading place, it very soon became a very significant manufacturing place. Um, and, in, um, and in 1650, by 1650, the tanners here had been asked to move over what is now Wall Street and start their industry only in the area which became uh, famously named the Swamp because it was basically a series of ponds at that time outside the city between Wall Street and what is now Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and that is a really famous part of the leather world. You just heard Steve talking about uh, vegetable tanning and the new mineral tanning with uh, chromium. The big meeting that decided that huge change for the leather industry took place in a restaurant called Racky's Restaurant in Frankfurt Street um, uh, in about 1880, with Brooklyn Bridge being built at that time, just on the edge of Frankfurt Street, uh, three years off opening. And in that famous, famous Anning Street, one man from the corset industry, both German immigrants, one was from the corset industry, an accountant, the other was from dye stuff uh, in industry. The chap from the corset industry was in charge of the Booth Group's activities in the United States was uh, of, uh, heading up a tannery in upstate New York in Gloversville. And what they wanted, as they sat with all the other tanners having lunch on Frankfurt Street, was how to make a bit of leather that was a bit waterproof, that you could cover the metal pieces in ladies' corsets, so that when uh, there was a bit of perspiration there, the leather didn't black from the metal getting wet and uh, stain the corset. And three years later, out came Mr. Schultz with a couple of patents which started the process of chrome to chrome tanning. Not the method we use now, but definitely the first significant moment when we had our chrome tanning. Just the other side of the city. Frankfurt Street and all the all the streets uh, are, um, are around, and that is just the fabulous excitement and involvement you have as you, you come to a place like New York, where leather has always been important from the very beginning and remains important um, um, today. And leather has evolved with the history, but nowadays it's very much evolved around two work types. One is functionality, the performance attributes of the element of leather, and the other is beauty, beauty and elegance, how it looks. Because the very big change in the leather industry from those times to now me, is that the consumer now has choices about buying leather or not buying leather. There are no areas today where there are not competitive materials for the consumer to choose. Whereas in 
history, there were very limited options for consumers. Nowadays, that's not true. Society is changing, technology is advancing, and manufacturers and consumers can offer us leather or can choose to go for something cheaper or different for whatever um, reason. Uh, and leather wins on function um, and on beauty in all the different multitude of end uses um, that it can be put into. Leather is a kind of contemporary on the one hand and a heritage material on the other and it performs multiple roles um, and it does help the consumer uh, um, with being able to express um, their identity. And it has this fabulous capability of being different things in different contexts and for different people. And it reaches far beyond just the beautiful and the functional into, in some way, being um, symbolic. And that relates in many ways to the fact that in our modern society, certainly the wealthier parts of our modern society, most of our needs are satisfied. So the old format of buying things uh, by the classic five-stage process of, of identifying need and going out and search, searching and comparing the various options and making the purchase, that's only used in a day tiny, tiny proportion of our purchases today. <coughs> Classical theory is really pretty much ir ir irrelevant because uh, nearly all our needs are well satisfied and we're not buying products um, because we need them. It's more for one reason or other because we like them and even more because the products that we think somehow or other uh, are helping us say something about who we are. Um, and that is a very big change uh, from the... Oh, Uh, as a tanner, 
how are you are uh, going to move your material forward to keep it relevant in the modern society. And the leather, our raw material, is very good at evolving to fit with contemporary society. We have to, as tanners, have to move it along through our understanding of what consumer expe expectations are. Um, leather itself, as a material, is precise. It, it's not an umbrella uh, term, leather, like textile. Textiles can be plant-based, textiles can be animal-based, like wool. Um, they can be uh, oil-based, like, uh, uh, like poly, poly, polyester. Um, um, plastics, uh, a huge umbrella for different types of PUs and PVCs and different types of material. Leather, sorry we're stuck. Leather is the hide and skin of an animal essentially intact. And we've been pretty strict on that definition since about the 16th century when it went into various acts of uh, parliament. The diversity you get within that, of course, is pretty great, just as Steve explained the different animals out of which you make leather. And you can get the, the, the wide diversity of leather types uh, that come from different animal types and different processing types. But it's a very distinct uh, origin that we are, uh, are working with. And the one thing that's absolutely true about that leather, which does give this complexity, which I'm trying to uh, uh, convey seems to be hugely important, but not well understood, is the fact that for all we make an engineered product today, for all we make a product very carefully uh, processed um, um, to be of extremely high quality. Um, we're not um, uh, synthesizing anything. What we are doing in manufacturing terms is a conditioning process. So we are mildly changing our raw material to make it slightly better for the end uses uh, to which it's going. And so we are starting with a complex collagen matrix that has a fantastic level of capabilities and strength. And we are ending with a complex collagen matrix um, whose strengths and capabilities and beauties we are uh, allowing it to maintain and keep for longer. And somehow that essential collagen natural nature uh, makes it um, a material that plays to our humanity. It's biophilic, um, it um, fits well in making us more comfortable in city life. It seems to be why we like to cover our gadgets with leather, because it humanizes the world of technology, of steel, of glass, and of city life, of, um, of um, city life. Um, we like to handle it, we like to touch it, we like to smell it, we like to, um, to, to, to work with it. Um, um, we um, love to, um, uh, to handle it, to look at it, uh, to hold it, uh, to, to wear it. Um, we love its durability. Um, there's a trust and honesty that comes with that durability. As Lisa said at the beginning, from many, many articles, that they grow better as they grow old. They don't wear out. Leather very rarely wears out. The threads might go, a zip might go, but it's very rare for leather itself to wear out. The articles be well designed. And the zip shouldn't be stuck too far inside that you can't easily access it, uh, access it and, um, and, and repair it. Um, integrity comes into this equation. Leather's not some throwaway material. Leather is entirely uh, 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 different. Longevity means um, that you are 
throwing less stuff away, and it means that you're needing to go up out and dig up or mine or quarry uh, new materials far less. Um, this is a really uh, big um, uh, thing to be thinking about in this awful modern uh, disposable uh, world. Think of things like um, airplanes. Um, I flew up um, the UK just last week and I was looking at the third last little row of seats as we went out the back door and the cushions were missing from a lot of the seats. And apparently what had happened was somebody had spilled the coffee, the coffee. Of course on a textile seat they had to take the cushions out leave them at base to get them dried out. If it were leather, what do you do? You wipe it down with a damp cloth. Off you go. Um, low maintenance, longevity. The seats, I've probably heard I'm a little bit Scottish and um, we fly a lot on, a, on British Airways, although I'm not sure how British it is anymore. Um, their short uh, haul aeroplanes have just replaced their leather seats. They were supposed to last for eight years, but actually they replaced them after 12 years. Um, now, if they had textile, they replaced those between three and five years. And of course, if you buy textile seats for an aeroplane, you have to buy 50% more. Why do you buy 50% more? Because every six months, you have to take the covers out and have them dry clean. After you have them dry clean, you've got to re-fireproof them and put them back in. A huge environmental load. Every six months washing, uh, dry cleaning, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, fireproofing. Twelve years. Well, what do you do with your old leather? Wipe it down with a damp cloth. What do you do if somebody spills something over it? Wipe it down with a damp cloth and carry on. Textile seat, you have stuff that seat can't be used until you can get it out properly clean and, uh, and, and dry. This is significant. So we have a wee hall in London, uh, the worshipful company of, of leather sellers. Kind of a grand, grand uh, thing. Um, that wall in there, that's their latest hall. They've sitting it in, I think, 650 years. And they're hoping that hall will last 200 years. And the one thing we know is that all of that wall, which is made of, uh, of leather, that'll be there in 200 years. And what maintenance will it have had in that 200 years? A dust gun, maybe? Nothing more. Uh, leather is just a fantastic, uh, uh, a fantastic uh, material. And of course I came up down from Grand Central this morning and there are two areas at Grand Central uh, where people will polish uh, your shoes for you. But I'm of that generation that likes seeing it as a as a weekend uh, as a weekend a weekend job. But if you can keep your shoes an extra year or two and not just buy them for a season um, and then throw them out, you're beginning to see the fantastic value of leather in this planetary battle that we are having uh, with uh, um, uh, loss of resources and wasteful uh, use of, uh, of resources. In um, scientific term, we're talking about product life extension. Product life extension is the first stage of the circular economy. The circular economy was really invented by uh, Professor Steyer, very elderly uh, Swiss gentleman now, but his product life in, uh, um, institution um, um, is, is still survives uh, and is still being run um, and he's just updated and republished a lot of his material. And what you're basically saying, if you want to uh, get at 70% of the benefits of what we call the circular economy, you do it with a couple of loop extensions at the beginning, which we tend to forget about 
And the first is for using things longer by looking after them. Nothing could be better than buying your shoes and keeping them a bit longer. Buying your clothes and keeping them a bit longer. And a little bit of maintenance is really wonderful uh, in, uh, in, in doing that. The next loop is to repair them and get them repaired. Um, and so the one thing I did notice in the swamp when I was over uh, on Sunday uh, seeing uh, the origins of New York's leather industry, other than street signs, there's no sign that it was a big leather uh, district, it's rather sad. But I did find a little Chinese co cobbler there, uh, ready to repair your shoes. And these are the sort of people we need to encourage. And what Stahill said is if across the board, not just leather things, but electronic goods and other, other <coughs> things, if we went to a repair type of economy, we should be employing 4% of our workforce. 4% of our workforce and jobs that will never be taken away by uh, um, artificial in, in intelligence. Um, this is big numbers, but this is an area in which leather has a perfect natural fit. It's not for fast fashion. It's, it's not for rapid disposal. Um, it's for value. It's for longevity. Uh, it's for, um, it's for um, uh, high quality. Um, and as our chairman said at the beginning, making of leather is both an art and a science. I think today, with the demands that we make on products, it is fair to say that the modern tanners that most uh, of us uh, work in now uh, make highly engineered products. And the new Italian machinery that we were hearing about from one of our sponsors early on has really begun to make huge strides in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 uh, uh, decades. They're not just machines that allow us um, to do our chemical processes. Um, we are beginning to see machines that are integrating intimately with the whole thinking about how we manage moisture, what we do at different stages in looking at that uh, fiber structure. It's quite unbelievable. Uh, what a wonderful precision product we can make. But there is no doubt that with leather being such an experiential material for the consumer, uh, that there is a huge artistic and craftsmanship element in its manufacture. And that's what makes leather such a nice material, a science and a craft uh, combined uh, personalization, beautification, artistry, and working with. Leather is unique in its ability to combine comfort, practicality, and beauty, to connect with consumers in complex ways, and it has this capacity of a unique material to, to, to uh, continue to redefine itself. That's leather that I've grown up with and worked all my life, and I hope during today you get some of that beautiful. Thank you very much.
to everybody. So I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very pleased now to share with you my experience. And let me say my experience in the, from the consumer side, from the buyer side, and also from the users. Let me say that uh, because my job is really traveling from one side to the other in the world, and talking and speaking with the, the several department stores, store, consumer, understanding what they like, which is their perception of them. So I really prepare this type of presentation. I wish you enjoy it. And then, a little bit later, I will explain you why I put in my back on this chair. So let's start. Of course, I want to talk about technology, creativity, and also, of course, uh, faces, the different faces and different aspects. And let me start with a very, very key point. It's not a matter of the name of the, the material. It's a matter of language. So this is my, my basic right now. So it's a matter of language. I want to talk about the way we express letter in a very contemporary way. For sure, I want to just express this. People are not going to store and looking to buy a piece of leather or a piece of silk or wool or something like that. People are buying products, styles, and concepts. And this is the reason why I put this picture which is a bag, which is made by leather. It's a pure and perfect, honey leather, one of the highest quality. But in the meantime, you have a detail that is appreciation of the contemporaneity. And let me give you some other little uh, insights. So we speak leather, but first of all, we speak about new stories to share. We don't want to listen to the old story. You want everything reshaped in a new way. So it's something like when you check Instagram. The, the first thing you will check it are the stories. It's the only place where people spend the most of the time. And they share all the information. So everything has to be moving. Little, little, little wraps. And new ways to define learning. This is the language I'm talking about. And this is... I mean, this is really the right time because we are here, we are all together. Most of all, we are the, the top expert that know letter in the deepest way. But now we have to find new languages for all those generations that they really want to change the name. They want to change completely. They want to change up completely the perspective. And now let's see some of these Suggesting some of the suggestions that can define leather. High tech and low tech. So in the previous two presentations, we see a lot of the technology and also hand making. So we talk about high tech and low tech. So we use this kind of word. Now I want to show you a video. This video is it's coming from an Italian tannery. And what I want to show you. Create the new letter. We we think to be like in a laboratory, uh, can be like in a movie, uh, in a scene, and they are experimenting a uh, new skin, very light, inflatable, perfect, uh, something that can be uh, respecting the new performance at this time. So this is a, a type of image that gives me the lightness, they give me the fluidity, they give me the, the, the beauty of this type of leather. But in the meantime, it's high-tech and low-tech. So, of course, we can have this type of skin. This can be the surface, the faces that we have it. Something very innovative, but in the meantime, I can feel the grain, I can feel the touching, I can feel the lighting, and I can, if I'm a designer, or if I'm a consumer, I can immediately imagine which is the message I can give to somebody else when I'm wearing this letter, when I'm covering a chair, when I'm using an object with this type of letter. Of course, I can be also this kind of image. And please 
please notice that the images that I'm showing to you are real leather. Even this, this image, this, this person, this bionic guy, it's wearing this kind of jacket, high, uh, turtle neck jacket in leather. And even we can go in other types of technology. We are still talking about skin, because leather is a skin. And in this case, this skin is inflated with high frequency. So it's maintaining the lightness, which is one of the most important elements. The touching and lightness are the two biggest requests that we have from the most of the consumer internationally. And I'm talking about the millennial, Generation Z, Generation Y, all types of generation that can also influence the father and the parents. Even bonded with other types of material. We don't dress leather 100% from top to down and reverse. Leather leave with other material. And the beauty is to find technology to mix it together and create in this kind of unexpected way. And even going inside of this kind of new surfaces of embossing, three dimensionality, a kind of new way to interpret the flower printing by using manual and eye tech techniques. And even this kind of very, very peach and finishing. So of course, I'm using the same word that we, that we listen when I have buyer in front of me and they try to express me what the consumer want. And the first thing that they will do it, it's touching, looking and feeling, and this is a kind of international uh, language. And even let's go inside of all geometries. Patterns are changing very much their expression. So little geometries, little in innovation of pleating, because pleating gives the message of architectural, something that has relief, something that can have volume, evolution a very contemporary image. And then of course we're going to the performance. And performance is one of the other very important elements because all of us knows how we can use it. But let me say that the performance can be also combined with technology that come from other types of field. Let's see in this case when I was talking about story. Let's Evolving and showing how can I change the different finishing by the machine by using images that attract me and give you the opportunity to see that perforation is one of the elements that was requested. But in this case, we have to. 3D perforation, 3D cut and perforation. Inside of the perforation, I can also digital printing inside. And look at, at the end of the day, I can have this kind of very futuristic image by using super fine and very light skin perforated. And even why not interpreting other types of faces? We talk about polka dot. In this case, we have abundant leather perforated in another layer with metallics. Of course, I, I, I try to put also some videos because one of the most important elements in the language that express leather is touching. So only when I see the movement of leather, I can feel the feeling that can I have under my fingers. So if I present the leather like a flat uh, image, I can't feel it and it's not quite impossible. Or let's see another element, stretch. In the performance, stretch is one of the most important part because stretch gives me the opportunity to be molded, to take other shapes, to leave over other boxes uh, shaping. In this case, I can also move the letter into other categories because leather is not only the traditional way to be used. It. We have plenty of lifestyle moment where we can use it. And even trims or frills, so which means decorated aspect like the different embroidery.
boundaries affect, but in this case I'm presenting you a bounded type surrender needed. And trust me, consumers love this. They really love it. Yesterday I, I did one of my, I just went to do my scouting around here in, in New York and I went to a pop-up store in uh, Louvre East Side. I, don't, I can't tell you the name, but you will guess it. So it was so interesting to arrive in a place where my idea was nobody was understanding about any types of material. It was a very top, big brand, luxury brand, creating this pop-up store for two weeks. And it was impressed, I was so impressed to see that the shop assistant was explaining me the beauty of a leather coat, pleated, and it was explaining me the beauty of this kind of pleating. And that, that was like, oh wow, this guy maybe knows something about leather. And then I said, no, he was knowing about leather. He was knowing about the performance and the beauty of this kind of effect. And again, let's go in other types of faces. We are talking again about leather, but here I really have this kind of three-dimensionality. And I can also imagine that this can become a component, an object, something that can live with me, live with me because it is my lifestyle product. And again, let's go inside the structural pleating as well. And here, I like the idea to give you two different ways to create the pleating effect. You can see one embossing in high frequency or the second one which is more by heat creating the pleating. And also bonded leather with mesh and synthetic material all put it together. When I'm saying that in this case I have also another types of effect of the three dimensionality. And then let's have several uh, suggestions, several suggestions that the purpose also in this case is giving to you the little element of innovation. Here I have the two tone, I have this kind of toned down dark metallics, but even in the same way I'm reinterpreting a kind of crocodile printing basic. And I recognize by the movement and by the touch of the little leather. Of course, two face bonded leather with a very fluffy material. In this case, it's like it's nice to work with uh, surely and working with a very, very thickened volumes, but lightness has to be the must always. And now let's discover the lifestyle. So lifestyle is one of the really, really topic of the moment. So it's something one, it's, it's a kind of way that we are dressing differently. We are not just buying bag and shoes and iPhone case. We are buying plenty of things for our life. Let's see this image. Of course, uh, some of you that live in online network scene or radio dispatcher. So this is an electronic machine, it's a coffee machine, covered by leather. And now we have plenty of application in objects that we are using in our everyday life. Because in this case, I embrace the concept of something which is luxurious, it's beautiful, it's, it's a kind of ritual, you know, drinking a coffee is a ritual. And in the same way, it's nice to get this kind of Rituality also with the types of material. And, and of course, I always like to put some of the techniques just to see, in, in this case, it's interesting to see how they created this kind of process. And then we have another type of application, which, let me tell you, I used the spectrum in, in my latest, I think, three months, and I presented in, in Korea, in Japan, in China, in, uh, in South Africa several places and I presented the concept of this. What you notice is to have a digital bulletin letter inside of a car. And the most appreciated is from the young generation. So you have the genuinity inside of the car. So of course the person that are much more technical in this kind of thing, they, they really know that it's a little bit, it's very difficult to have a natural skill inside on a car. 
for automotive, we have plenty of certification to follow. And this is a kind of extreme that the tannery wanted to propose. And then again, let's go inside of other types of concept, softness. I, I heard from my previous presentation the softness they touch it. So the beauty of this kind of elements that the only pure letter can give to us. You can keep it and maintain it, but incorporating this kind of high-tech performance and not embossing by stitching. Because stitching in this case is considered much more older. I'm also using high frequency. And this is the other types of element. And then, of course, luxurious toys. This is another very important thing. Uh, football uh, ball, uh, or the ping pong, basket, tools, all these kind of gaming little tools are becoming the best attraction for most department store because it, they prefer to put this kind of leather toys, or let me see, high top, very new design toys, because they are much more attractive. And I'm talking about brands which are very, very top. I can give you some names right now. So we, we move from Hermene Gildozenia to Chanel, from Armani to Vuitton, from several brands that they absolutely understood the value of the letter, but they understood the types of the product has to be completely different. So this is the reason why I was talking about we buy a product, we buy a concept. And again, other elements, and in this case I love it, to incorporate this kind of combination of a very antique tradition of a subtle maker. And I like this video so much because it's given well, the potential of the carving the letter and creating the subtle, subtle stitching, the subtle, subtle finishing since the beginning. But let's see the transformation of today. I want to use the same concept of construction but incorporating in types of shape which are extremely more innovative. And even another very important element, longevity, memory, and revive. And let me say, let me tell you that this is a kind of the interpretation of one of the aspects of sustainability. Sustainability, it's also recycling something. So imagine when you buy, you go in a vintage, high vintage store, you buy the best vintage bags from the past, you buy a Kelly bag, you buy some of the pieces, they are made by leather. So longevity can be also the memory to keep and maintain the same product because live with generation. And trust me, the young generation is very concerned about this. And they like the idea to take back pieces that they found it, but this has to be in leather. And of course, let me show you some of the interpretation how to maintain and keep this kind of longevity. This is a, is a boxing and weaving uh, techniques, creating objects and creating little objects like sport elements or the vintage pieces I was talking about. These are two pictures, just a couple of pictures that I found. So where you can see purely original vintage. Maybe just move after two or three generations. And this is another very interesting element. Or let me see another types of uh, taking back memories. In this case, it's a kind of combination between moderns and old techniques. You can see the old techniques of bug relief, which is the heritage techniques, but you can also see on the other side, so this kind of laser cutout application that can interpret the memory and put this memory in a futuristic stage. And also this kind of rustic embellishment, combining, again, uh, quite more traditional techniques like and even laser perforating, where the laser perforation is maintaining and keeping a new pattern. And then we have another element, which is another world that absolutely 
And it's so important to be incorporated in the new language or in the language. So the circular life. I don't want to just talk about economy. I don't want to talk about the life, listening, which is the life in the different stages. Let's see this video, which is made by one, again, by another kind of companies that give to us the circular life of different material, including. <laughs> storytelling. I have the ingredients, I have all the different stuff, mixing and melting the different elements. But this is a kind of way to give little insights, the short insights, some notes. I read it, I get in my mind, and, and I want to see again other elements. And of course, we go also inside of creative manipulation. So manipulation, in this case, I wanted to show my latest uh, slides, I've given to you leather. This is leather. Leather, it's intricate, it's performing. I can, I can work it out in so many different ways. But one of the very important things that I also noticed from some of the students at the, uh, at the Parsons School, that I see them from this morning, it's when you work with leather, you need to understand leather. You need to understand how it's moving, how it's moving, how you can use it. And this is the language we have to use. Can I cut it? Can I perforate it? Which is the performance I can get, which is the best element I can get it. I can be immersed inside of it. And also look at this. In this case, I have this kind of effect of soft imprinting. But I, I again incorporated the two different elements, a robot hand and, and a hand, a human hand. And even in this kind of in this kind of example, so the manipulation of the skin with the cutter, giving this kind of airy effect, fluid effect, something they can they can wear in, in, a, in a certain way. And and even look at when you move it. You see the movement, you see the fluidity. And look at in this case, experience with the crystals. And this is like, I took at this kind of example that's come from one of the experimental area that Lina Bell is organizing, Innovation Square, where we invited to experiment in the different natural surfaces using really the different unexpected material. And even look at in, a, in this other kind of element. I have a I have a pattern which is very traditional, but the way it was being made is very innovative because it's not a normal embossing. And let me give you another topic, of course. <laughs> Later, it's feedback. Because we want also to give the different human, human aspects. So letter it's famous something like this. Look at this kind of uh, smoothness, intarsia, uh, this kind of fluidity, stretch, this kind of delicacy. So many times I've seen images that talk about leather and I always think, oh, why do you want to push the aggressivity, the aggressive things in the strength? This is so female. And look at this kind of 
image of this lady. This is a painting made by digital with a little touch of spray on the edge. It's high frequency stitcher, it's not gluing, and we have two types of skin, and on the top we have vegetable tongue skin. So we use the beauty of vegetable tongue skin, which highlight the different shades. This is eBay because it's very emotional in a certain way. Always a full body. When I define a full body of skin, I don't want to just feel that this is strong. It's full body, it's full rounded, it's a rounded feeling. And even the figurative aesthetic, which is a family in a certain way that in looking in this case, in this case I can have this kind of reflective three, three dimension in the, in the painting. And even this kind of, when we talk about softly vaporizing, vaporize can be like the same feeling that I have in the cosmetic tools, because most of the cosmetic tools are finishing the vaporize, and leather is the best material to have this kind of finishing. And also, females, because we talk about incorporating techniques that come from jewels, from embellishment of the gold and silver jewels world. And in this case, you can see it on the element. And of course, emphasizing the deepness of the imprinting, the deepness of the embossing, so with this, this type of looking. And as my last slide, something that can give you another kind of uh, information about, we talk about lace, and we can make lace by letter, but in the same times, we can also use traditional techniques and embossed perforated in high frequency and even uh, finish it in this kind of um, high stitcher techniques. So I'm finished my presentation, but before to the stage, I like to explain this kind of that. So this is a bag. You can say you can think it's a simple bag, and this is purely made by leather. It's a super super soft skin. But I didn't move for this. It's because it's a look. It's because we need to be innovative. And even at the same time, I discover a surprise. It's not dyed, it's not hand dyed. It means that some technology has to come from somewhere. And then they have this color around. And this made me, oh, wow, I love it. How much it cost? I don't care. I love it. <laughs> so, that's my pieces. I don't need to wear leather all day long. That's the pieces. Thank you so much.
this huge, yeah. This is like AC Lawrence.
Okay, we are going to start the second panel. So please take your drink and take your seat. present you 
some of the initiatives of uh, TAN industry relate to sustainability. As Gustavo was saying, uh, TAN industry has adopted several actions in these last uh, years regarding the sustainability of its process. I will try to give a brief look, a brief, uh, brief overlook of this initiative, mainly refer to the Italian and European context that I know better, so I'm sorry for the American representative I, uh, that I would, uh, about this focus. In any case, I think that uh, uh, many of these uh, actions can be generalized uh, also to uh, the American dining industry. <coughs> I will start saying that in the last year we have observed uh, more and more higher and higher attention on the environmental impact of the fashion industry. Two years ago, Ellen MacArthur Foundation has published a report uh, titled uh, Design in the, fashion, the Future of Fashion Industry, where they highlighted how uh, uh, in this industry less of the 1% of material are in use and so are recycled in the sector or how uh, the industry accounts for about 20% uh, of the wool uh, wastewater uh, at the global level. And so, uh, as you can see from this snapshot, uh, important institutions like United Nations Environmental Program start to publish and to speak about fast fashion or Google has uh, adopted, has uh, uh, initiated a, a pilot in order to calculate uh, the environmental impact of uh, of fashion industry. Uh, these, all this attention of this last year has naturally stimulated uh, some answers, has naturally stimulated uh, uh, initiative in uh, fashion and luxury brands. And so fashion brands are starting, uh, or has started some years ago, to push uh, and to put pressures on their suppliers in order to demonstrate the sustainability of their process. Here again, some snapshot about some initiative of Gucci, Louis Vuitton, or Barbary, and uh, their initiative towards sustainability. In, the frame, in this framework, as part of the fashion industry, also the leader in the industry uh, over time has been called to face uh, several challenges towards sustainability. Challenges that has stimulated their commitment towards sustainability. Surely an environmental challenge. It's clear that, and everyone knows, that standing industry is a quite environmental complex industry. They use water, they have wastewater, they use uh, solvents and they have air emissions uh, and they use other chemicals in their process. So uh, they have surely environmental challenges to face. They have also economic challenges. Often sustainability and eco-innovation seen by Western countries' standards as uh, a leverage for their competitiveness. So as a pressure uh, to improve their environmental competitiveness in this case. They have a social challenges. Some tanneries in Europe are located in industrial areas that are sometimes close to residential areas, and so they have to face uh, uh, traffic uh, or others that can somehow uh, increase the sensitiveness of population of citizens that are in the neighboring of this area. And in addition, regulatory challenges. Uh, one of the speakers of this morning in the opening section was saying that uh, is a stricter and stricter the regulation in the United States. The same in Europe. We have uh, directives from the European Commission that put, that impose to tanneries, for example, the adoption of BAT, the best available techniques, the techniques that uh, European Commission identified as the best for the environmental protection and that are economically uh, viable. <clears throat> In addition, we have to say that uh, another challenge to face by the tanneries is also a sort of uh, hold bad reputation. So, some uh, uh, part of 
population uh, thinking about uh, uh, tanneries probably has in mind the picture on the left side where tanneries, uh, uh, where you can see a tannery of the beginning of the 19th century in Europe, of tanneries in the developing countries. But in this last year, the situation is uh, fully changed. As uh, one of the speakers previous was highlighting, uh, the working condition and the uh, machineries are uh, modern and somehow the evolution of the sector has been uh, uh, huge in this, in this kind of uh, environmental and health uh, protection. Uh, so all these uh, uh, all these challenges have stimulated tanneries to provide responses and to provide a strong commitment towards sustainability. Here we can see some data of the uh, Italian tanny industry published by Unich that observe in a sample of uh, Italian tanneries how the environmental investments, the environmental cost sustained by the Italian tanning industry has been more than doubled in the last uh, 14 years. And this investment has produced uh, uh, important environmental benefits in terms of resource efficiency. Here we have some examples regarding the savings of energy and water achieved in the same period or in, the, in terms of, uh, of waste production. <coughs> Again, another uh, answer to the uh, to the um, these challenges to face another proof of the commitment to our sustainability is the fact that uh, uh, circular economy is uh, a concept that is intrinsically embedded in tanning uh, in tanning industry. Uh, tanning industries are using by products a waste of another. Uh, industry that is food industry. It's calculated that uh, uh, the 99.5 percent of uh, uh, raw material used by tanning industry, by or of raw hides using by tanning industry, is uh, a waste, a byproduct of food industry. And this aspect is also officially recognized recently by European Commission. Okay, without giving you detail in the frame of a working group where experts of uh, uh, food industry and tanning industry uh, were part, they decide that the amount of uh, environmental impact came from agriculture and uh, slaughterhouses sector uh, to be allocated to tanning is less than 0.2%. The rest of the environmental impact of this uh, upstream, of this uh, upper part of the supply chain must be allocated to the food industry. And so, in somehow, uh, this is or officially uh, confirmed at the European level. <clears throat> in addition, uh, okay, tanning industry is, is producing an intermediate product, so in somehow we can speak about eco-design of uh, final product. But in any case, we can speak about eco-design of the uh, productive process. So, uh, in, the, in the last year, some uh, eco-innovative action has been adopted uh, in the frame of the, the production process. For example, actions aimed to reduce the consumption of chemicals, like uh, the adoption of automatic uh, uh, dispensing, in order also to improve the health and working condition of employees. In addition uh, to the need, to the commitment to save and to use less, uh, less chemicals, also several research, research activities have been carried out regarding the substitution of chemicals and the experimentation of uh, kind of processes in order to uh, maximize the uh, efficiency of the use of chemicals. So in short, produce more meter square of finished leader by using the same amount of chemicals in the drums, for example, or also for the finishing uh, phase. Uh, more and more advanced uh, finishing machines are present in the market. Spray guns that uh, allow to reduce the use of solvents, the use of paints, the use of the, and to avoid the so-called overspray 
in the finishing of the, of the of the liver. So somehow again achieving a, a high uh, resource efficiency uh, results. Uh, okay, we have seen in technological um, action. What about uh, a green management action? For example, uh, the initiative related to supply chain management aimed to uh, uh, highlight, aimed to collect information about traceability of raw hides or to adopt uh, uh, green criteria, for example, to select uh, more uh, sustainable uh, suppliers of raw materials, of, of chemicals. <coughs> Another uh, environmental management action is referred to the uh, use of PEF, the product environmental footprint, that is uh, an innovative uh, tool uh, launched by the European Commission in 2015. Uh, the European tanning industry has been part of the pilot phase regarding the product environmental footprint in order to establish uh, with other few manufacturing industry the rules at the European Commission level regarding this important tool that in somehow allow tanning entrepreneurs to identify which are the most important environmental impact adopting a life cycle uh, perspective. Uh, okay. Okay, this is a picture is missed. Uh, apart the technological responses and uh, the management responses that we have seen, I would like to uh, describe you, to conclude my presentation, a specific case of an industrial cluster uh, of Italy located in Tuscany region between the province of uh, Pisa and Florence uh, uh, that uh, uh, can be classified as a sort of uh, territorial and cooperative response uh, to the uh, to the challenges that we have seen before and to express their commitment towards sustainability. The cluster produces uh, about 35% of the wool Italian production, uh, taking into account that uh, uh, the wool Italian production represents the 66% of the EU production. You can understand the relevance of this uh, industrial area, industrial cluster. This industrial cluster covered a territorial area of four municipalities, 800 firms, and uh, all the, these, fir are, these firms are mainly uh, small and medium enterprises. So a sort of common and cooperative approach was needed to face the sustainability challenges. Uh, if we look uh, to the main waste uh, uh, produced by the Italian sector, we can see how shavings, uh, flashings, sludge, and tanning vats are the main uh, part in terms of quantity of waste produced. And uh, in this cluster, this cooperation, cooperative approach has been adopted uh, to solve uh, the waste management, uh, especially in this kind of waste. So, what has been adopted, what has been done in this industrial cluster. First of all, has been, uh, the, the territorial cooperative approach has been adopted through uh, four main common infrastructure to serve the whole industrial area uh, and the company locates. In the cluster there are two, two very big uh, wastewater treatment plants. All these wastewater treatment plants apply the circular economy recovering its their sludge. The first one is connected through a pipeline to another company that dry this sludge and recover them in the building sector. The second wastewater treatment plant recover the sludge uh, in the fertilizer uh, as fertilizer. We have they have two wastewater treatment plants because they have the river, the Arno River, the same river of Florence that pass in the middle of the cluster and so. Uh, they have decided to, to adopt to, to so big uh, infrastructure. In addition, in Astra, in another big infrastructure, recover all the chromium parts from the companies in order uh, to recover the chromium that are in the, in the wastewater and to resell salt of chromium to the companies that are located in the cluster. So adopting again a circularity of the uh, flow of chromiums. In addition, there is another uh, big uh, 
the common infrastructure that regular flashings and shavings uh, derived from company again for uh, for uh, producing fertilizer. So we have been contacted with uh, my colleague of my university in order to solve an issue. The local industrial association was uh, asked us to uh, solve to respond uh, to, to this question. So they say, okay, in these last 30 years we have invested in this common infrastructure, but which is the environmental benefit? of the level of the single product, which is the environmental benefit of the single meter square of leader that can derive from this uh, engagement, from this commitment, from this uh, uh, common infrastructure. So we have carried out a study that it has been also two years ago published in an American journal of the sector of journal of opinion production. How we did? We carried out an average life cycle assessment, in short, is a tool to understand the environmental if impacts of the products. We calculate the environmental impacts of a meter square of the cluster of Santa Croce Sublarno and then we compare this uh, average LCA with the environmental impacts of an, again a meter square uh, of uh, a meter square of finished leader of a situation that we call scenario two where this common infrastructure were not present and so the sludge were sent uh, to landfill or the chromium were not recovered but sent to wastewater treatment plant and then purify and then uh, the water discharge as usually happen in not so advanced uh, industrial cluster. Then we simply compare these two life cycle assessment in order to see how the impacts uh, were uh, differentiating from changing from scenario one to scenario two. And so uh, the scenario one, we, were, we had a situation where common infrastructure and the cluster were present, and so chromium sludge and uh, shaving and flashings were recovered to a situation where uh, in the scenario two, this uh, common infrastructure were not uh, uh, adopted or developed. Uh, and to build this scenario, we refer to other territorial area and the uh, other common or uh, other common way to manage uh, this waste. We collect a uh, quite huge uh, sample of uh, of, uh, of data. We collect data from 22 tunnels that was about uh, 14 uh, representation. The sample represent uh, 14 uh, percent uh, of the total production of cluster around five. Uh, Italian production, and these uh, were the results. In the first line, you can see some impact categories that are codified by the life cycle assessment tool, and in the third and the fourth column, you can see the results of the impact referred to one meter square of Finnish leader uh, in one scenario, in the scenario one, where the, where the, where the initiative of circular economy were. Uh, adopt, like I described before, the second scenario where the no circular economy were not adopted. As you can see, adopting this uh, initiative, this uh, commitment towards sustainability in this industrial area, one meter square of litter uh, producing that area is, uh, has a less carbon footprint of 22% or uh, photochemical ozone formation uh, lower than 40% or freshwater terrestrial autropication of 18%. Naturally, we have provided this data to the local industrial association and they current, still currently are using this data as green marketing uh, leverage to our brands and to our customers that uh, want to uh, uh, have suppliers in the area. Thank you. That was uh, very interesting because it uh, puts uh, together what is the perception and actually the reality. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is <laughs> Gustavo Gonzalez Quijano. I'm the Secretary General of Cortans, which is the, the European Leather Trade Association. So I'm the, the kind of the, the, the ambassador of the leather industry in Brussels and uh, defend the industry in front of the European institutions. Well, such a, uh, I have also to do with the development of the environmental uh, footprint category rules 
uh, in an initiative that has been developed by the European Commission. Um, the that was very, very interesting. I think that one, I, one thing I would like to add to your presentation, and that's um, that actually leather has more than just one life cycle. Because at the end of the useful life of, uh, let's speak about the couch or a chair, etc., leather has still another opportunity to live. And uh, that has been exemplified also by here in the United States, Amtrak, which is the railroad uh, uh, system here, the, the, the train uh, uh, company here in, in the United States, uh, they have some leather seating and they have used the leather seat, the leather from these leather seats, when they change the, 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 the materials, into producing some backpacks that they sell at a very high price. So you see that after the useful life of the leather in the seating in the train, you can find for leather also a second life and maybe a third one. What's going to happen after this backpacks when they are not anymore usable or used by, by the person? So you see that leather, circular economy is really inscribed into the DNA of leather and uh, um, it's interesting, it's, in, it's important because that extends the useful life of uh, this material, which is very important. Now, uh, I'm very privileged to introduce you now to the next speaker of this panel, and uh, it's uh, Professor Frank Mitlöner. Frank Mitlöner, I met him in person in 2016, it was in Rome. Uh, we met uh, when, uh, for a committee meeting of the LEAP pro project, which is the the Livestock Emission Assessment Project that was developed by the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, of the United Nations. And, uh, um, well, Frank has been chairing this committee from the start of this initiative, uh, which was a kind of response to the, to the Livestock Long Shadow report that FAO published some 10 years ago, and that had, had put up quite a lot of bad and, and uh, the incorrect uh, information about the emissions of livestock, which is actually our base material, where livestock, we draw our resources from, from the livestock sector. So Frank Mitlöne is a professor and air quality specialist in uh, the Department of Animal Science in the University of California, Davis. Uh, he, is, uh, he studied in, in, in Europe, actually, in, in Leipzig, and he may also um, um, a PhD in animal science in Texas University, uh, the Te Technical University of Texas. Well, uh, Frank is uh, uh, an expert in agriculture and air quality, livestock housing and husbandry, and uh, his, uh, his expertise has led him to be uh, nominated for positions of very high relevance, like for instance in this committee of the Food and Agriculture Organization, but not only, he is also uh, a member of the, of the President's Councils of Advisors of Science and Technology and a member of the National Academy Academies of Science Institute of Medicine Committee, a framework for assessing the health, environmental and social effects of the food system. It's very complex, very difficult to, to so I have to read it. Frank, uh, I think now, you have the floor. Please fill us in of the truth and uh, the misperceptions of livestock emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gustavo. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and speak in such a, in front of such an uh, illustrious group of people. A uh, very unusual audience for me. So uh, I will try to uh, break down some of those. Um, Misconceptions, I want to say, that are out there uh, in the public. Uh, depicting livestock is one of the main environmental hazards of our life. Uh, so I was asked to talk about facts and fiction around livestock's uh, environmental footprint. And uh, I will have a couple of slides that might be a little bit technical, uh, just talking about greenhouse gases, because a lot of the discussion that's out there right now is on the carbon footprint of livestock. I think everybody here has heard about livestock's carbon footprint and why we should replace animal-sourced foods with more plant-based foods. 
um, and based burgers and so on, everybody has heard about them. Uh, then I will talk about something that uh, is also uh, often discussed, which is the so-called 2050 challenge, the drastic increase in human population. Um, and then, you know, just talk a little bit about efficiencies and so on. I hope I, uh, I will not disappoint you. So, uh, just as I said, a few slides around what greenhouse gases are. Because everybody hears this term all the time. You hear about methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and different gases that are so-called greenhouse gases. Well, what does that really mean? There are three of these main greenhouse gases. Uh, and what you see here is, I would just point at it really quickly, the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, that solar heat would be reflected back into space. If there weren't these so-called greenhouse gases, gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, these gases effectively form a carpet, like a carpet uh, trapping the heat from the sun in our lower atmosphere. And the thicker that carpet becomes, a carpet of these greenhouse gases, the more heat is retained and the hotter it becomes. Okay? So here you see the three bad boys, CO2 on the left side, methane in the middle, and nitrous oxide on the right. These are three gas molecules. And when, imagine my fist being one of those molecules, when these gases are hit by a solar beam, they track the heat from the sun and they retain that. The more of these gases you have in the atmosphere, the more heat trapping you get. And that had traditionally always been characterized by a simple number. And that number is referred to as the so-called global warming potential where people say methane is 28 times worse than CO2. And here's where most people stop. They say methane is worse than CO2. Ruminant livestock such as cattle, sheep, and goats produce that methane. And therefore, we have to limit the number of these animals because then we produce less methane. What those people who say that to the public do not represent is that there are other differences between these gases that are very important. For example, once you drive your car and you put CO2 in the atmosphere by burning gas, that CO2 that's in the atmosphere will have a lifespan of a thousand years. Any CO2 you've ever put into the atmosphere in your life is still there, still in the atmosphere. The only way for CO2 to go is upward, okay? There's no real process to reduce CO2 at least not add to the amounts or in the amounts that we are putting into our atmosphere. But here is where the big differences uh, lie between CO2, which is a long-lived climate pollutant with a thousand year lifespan, versus methane, which only lives for 10 years. Once methane is put into the atmosphere, it lives for 10 years and 10 years only, and then it's destroyed. And that's obviously a big difference. Again, I will not give you here a biochem lecture or so, but I want to really point out one important difference between greenhouse gases from livestock versus greenhouse gases, let's say, from fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas. On the livestock side, I take you back to your high school years, okay? Think back to photosynthesis. Think back to a plant. What does a plant need to grow? It needs CO2 from the air, and it needs sunlight from the sun. And once it has CO2 from the air and sunlight, these plants grow. Sooner or later, in livestock, agriculture, these plants will be eaten by, let's say, a cow in this picture. And inside this cow's stomach, that carbon-containing plant here will partly be changed into what's called methane. And that's what you see here, coming out the front end of these animals. They are belching it out. That methane will be in the air for 10 years, will then be converted into CO2, and that same CO2 is then going back into plants, back into animals, back into the atmosphere. And it's a circle. It goes around and around and around. Again, methane is in the atmosphere for 10 years, and then it's no longer there. The amount of methane that's produced by livestock, the amount of methane that's produced in general in our world's atmosphere, is equal the amount of methane that's being destroyed. As long as we don't add new additional uh, uh, livestock to our livestock herds, we are not adding more methane, thus more warming to our atmosphere. That's a big difference compared to what you see on the right side here, which are fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas at the bottom. They were stored in the ground for hundreds of millions of years as decayed plant material. And then that oil, coal, and gas was extracted 
And what did we do to that carbon containing stuff? We burned it. So where is that carbon now? It's in the atmosphere. And every time that it gets hit by the sun, these molecules heat up and trap it. This here, the fossil fuel side of this diagram on the right side, is very different from the left side. The left side is a circular and short lived circle. On the right side, we have a one way street from the bottom up into the top. So, again, I will not talk about this anymore, uh, but I wanted to point this out. So, now you hear very often that livestock is one of the leading uh, causes of climate change and of greenhouse gases in general. Globally, that number is about 14.5%. That's all livestock in the world, 14.5%. But there are huge differences across different regions in the world with respect to how much greenhouse gases livestock emit. In the United States, for example, it's not 14.5%, and that number or a number similar to that should never be used here or in European countries because we have very different emissions from our livestock compared to, let's say, a country such as India or countries in Africa, and I will show you in a minute why. This here is a diagram from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, and it shows different main sectors of emissions of greenhouse gases. On the left you see a truck, and it says 28%. That means that transportation in the United States emits 28% of all greenhouse gases. Energy, so there's power production and use, another 28%. Industry, that's mainly the cement industry needed for producing concrete, 22%. So these first three industries combined make up 80%, 80 percent, 80 of all greenhouse gases in the United States. The same numbers hold true for most of Europe. All those fossil fuel consuming industries are responsible for approximately 80% of greenhouse gases in developed countries. You see then a cow here and a number 9%. That 9% are total greenhouse gas emissions from all of agriculture. Not just animal agriculture, all of agriculture. So that's animal and plant agriculture combined. According to the Environment Protection Agency and this emission inventory, which is the latest one, animal agriculture in the United States contributes to 3.9%. That's called that 4%. That's all beef, all dairy, all sheep and goats and, 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 and poultry and so on, 3.9%. That is a number that you should remember because oftentimes we are confronted with the assertion that livestock produces more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships in the world combined. And this is nothing but misleading and, in my opinion, very dangerous. Because what it suggests is that all we need to do is watch what we eat, because that, they say, is the main culprit of our carbon emissions and then everything else we do can be relaxed upon. And that is not the case. There are many activities you are involved in, for example flying here, that are way more environmentally impactful than what you eat. That's not for me to say that what you eat doesn't matter, but on a scale it is dwarfed by other activities we all engage in. So this is the Environmental Protection Agency official emission inventory. This is just another depiction of the same thing the EPA emission inventory, what you see on the x-axis are the years 1990 to 2017, on the y-axis you see total greenhouse gases. And the only reason why I want to show this is because this green area, uh, area down there, that's the total contribution of all of agriculture, not just animal agriculture, all of agriculture. It just shows you how important agriculture is compared to everything else we do. Okay? Agriculture clearly has contributions, but of course we need to eat. And every time you produce food, we will have environmental footprint. However, that footprint is dwarfed by other things we do. And you will see that in a minute. Now think of all the greenhouse gases cause, causing climate change in the world combined. Everything in the world combined is 49. The number is 49 gigatons okay, in the world, all greenhouse gases. Of that, the United States is responsible for 12% of all global greenhouse gases. 12%. And this slide here shows what I'm saying. These are all greenhouse gases, that's the total five. And then this piece here in blue, uh, purple, and gray, that's the total greenhouse gases associated with the United States. In blue you see the portion of US greenhouse gases that's fossil fuel related. Fossil fuel is 11 of the 12% of US contribution. 
And then you see those tiny ones here. The purple one is animal agriculture and the gray one is plant agriculture. Of everything that's produced and consumed in the United States with respect to food, that contributes to 1.1% of total global greenhouse gases. I'll give you one more number. I'm originally from Germany. Germany as a country makes up 2% of all global greenhouse gases. 2% of the total of all global greenhouse gases. If the whole of Germany would stop eating meat today, it would be 0.05% of total global greenhouse gases, which is not measurable. We could never measure, that's what I do for a living. I measure gases, believe it or not, that's, my, that's what I do. <laughs> we could not measure that ever. So that's not for me to say we should not worry about what we eat and where and so on. We should, but I just want to put it into perspective. Fossil fuel use by far is the main, the main culprit of climate emissions. This slide here is a very important one. It brings those 300 undergraduate students I teach at, at UC Davis to the fronts of their seats. It is the so-called 2050 challenge. What it shows on the x-axis are the years 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. On the z-axis, you see total human population in billion. I just turned 50. When I was a little boy, we were right here at 3 billion people. Today, we are at 7.6 billion people. And by the time I'm an old man, we will be at 9.5 billion people. In other words, throughout my lifetime and yours, human population on this planet will have tripled. We will have three times more people on this planet during our lifetimes. And this is the challenge of our lifetimes. Because how do we feed three times more people on this planet without depleting all natural resources we have? That's the question. When you ask people in the place where I live, in Davis, California, how we should do that, they say we should go back to the 1950 dairy and beef operation and poultry. They think a poultry operation with more than 200 chickens is not sustainable. They think if you have a dairy with more than 50 cows, you are a mega dairy. I have news for them. The efficiencies that we have learned to develop in animal agriculture are not different from those that were just presented to you by my, uh, by, by my uh, uh, fellow speaker. Efficiencies in food production have no alternatives to them. Because otherwise, we will deplete all natural resources on this planet with lightning speed. What you see on this graph, too, is two different colors. You see this, uh, whatever this color is, this orange here, that's human population in developed countries such as North America and Europe. And then you see this other color here, and that's human population increase in developing countries. As you can see, human population is going skyrocket high. Not so much because everybody's having 10 babies, but because of increasing life expectancies. Throughout the world, people are getting older, and we all want to live a long life, but cumulatively that means that we have more mouths to feed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the 2050 challenge. And the question in front of me and my colleagues is, how do we satisfy that challenge? This year, I think, is a very important slide. It shows the world and the circle over Southeast Asia. This circle over Southeast Asia contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside than outside this circle. Every 10 years, the population of the United States is added to that circle. So clearly one of the food security areas of the world. But even though it's a significant one, it's not the number one. The number one is depicted here. You can see Southeast Asia will increase by 41%, South and Southeast Asia. Africa will increase by almost 50%. South America by 7, North America by 4, Europe will slightly shrink. The 2050 challenge is real. But it is not a challenge that's equally important throughout the world. It is a main challenge in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. This slide here from a German news magazine shows it nicely. You can see China will slightly shrink by 3%. Bangladesh and India will each increase by a quarter. And now look at these African countries. They will increase by at least 100%, meaning their populations will double every 10 years double every 10 years. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where the 2050 challenge will play out. And we must assist them to overcome the challenges they have. Because if we don't, they will be very unhappy and they will start marching to wherever they need to go to make a living for their families.
And if you don't believe me, just go back two years ago and see what happened in Germany. Just two years ago, a million people streamed into that one country in one year. And these were people pretty much fleeing from food insecurity and conflict related to that and so on. It's a very important question. Whether we have three, seven, nine, or 12 billion people in the world, this year, ladies and gentlemen, is the only land we have to grow crops to feed these people. I will now show you one of my favorite depictions of the challenge. This here is a normal sheet of paper. Imagine this to be the size of the surface of the earth, okay? I will now fold this piece of paper, and I will fold it twice. And what you see now is the total amount of land, because the rest is water and ice. This is all land in the world, the rest is water and ice. This is my business card, and the equipment area of my business card in the world is all agricultural land. So this here is all land, and this is all agricultural land to grow food for people. You can see it's not very much. The rest is deserts, and jungles, and cities, and so on. This is all agricultural land. Now I take my business card and I fold it into one piece that's two-thirds its original size, and the other piece one-third, and then I rip my own business card into pieces. Remember, this is all agricultural land. The larger of the two pieces is what we call marginal land. This is land that's used for agricultural purposes, but the soil is not good enough or there's not enough water to grow crops. What do you think we do with that land currently? Anybody? We use it for grazing ruminant livestock, such as cattle, sheep, and goats. They are the only ones that can make use of that land. Why? Because they have a stomach system that allows them to digest cellulose. Nobody else can digest that but ruminant animals. 70% of all agricultural land used today in the world is used with ruminant livestock and cannot be used with anything else. Those people who say we should divorce ourselves from animal agriculture, get rid of it altogether, would effectively advocate that we will not make use of 70% of all agricultural land, the so-called marginal land. Unthinkable, unthinkable in my mind. Because the only other land used for that land would be golf courses or something else, but nothing food related. The remainder of my business card, this one third, is the total amount of agricultural land in the world that's referred to as arable. Here you can grow crops. For humans or for animals. This is how limited we are. This is how limited we are. So the 2050 challenge is real and we are resource limited and we must make use of all resources known to man in order to satisfy our not just nutritional but resource uh, uh, demands. What well, you see on this side are greenhouse gases in developing countries on the left side, related to livestock, and developed uh, countries on the right side. And what you can see on the right side is that greenhouse gases are plateauing. So they're not increasing anymore, even though we're producing more and more livestock products, we are not increasing emissions. On the left side you see that greenhouse gases associated with livestock are going up. Why? because more and more people demand animal source foods and in order to satisfy that demand, more and more livestock is produced. This slide is a very important one. I know I take you far out here with respect to your area of expertise, but on the x-axis here you see total amount of milk produced per cow per year. Milk produced per cow per year. On the left side you see low producing cows, on the right side high producing cows. And the y axis shows the carbon footprint, the, the greenhouse gas footprint, pretty much. What you see here on the left side is that cows that produce very little milk have a very high carbon footprint. This is the equivalent of you running in your car, you're turning it on on your driveway, but you're not driving it. You just run it all week, and then you drive it once to a supermarket, and then you come back and you keep it running. Not very efficient use of a car. This is what we call idle livestock, because these animals are fed food and so on, but they are not producing much product. So you can see here on the left side, cows produce about a thousand or so pounds per mil of, of milk per cow per year. And on the right side, we see very high producing cows. For example, here in the United States, the average cow produces 23,000 pounds of milk. 
23,000 pounds of lift per year. In India, it's 1,000 pounds. You need 23 times the number of cows in India to produce the same as one cow here. Five times more in Mexico than one cow here. I'm not talking badly about certain countries. I don't want to single out anyone. What I'm telling you is there are massive differences in efficiencies. And we can and must overcome these differences because we are that resource limited. We must help those countries in the world that currently don't have a veterinary system, don't have proper genetics, don't have proper feeding to overcome their challenges. This is an ethical must. This is not a can. It's a must. This slide here shows different regions in the world on the x-axis and the carbon footprint on the y-axis. And you can see that the same areas that are depicted as the major challenges for the 2050 challenge also are the ones with the highest carbon footprint per minute production, which is depicted here. So West Asia and Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and so on, have the highest carbon footprint, not just for milk production, also of beef, poultry, and so on. The same areas that need it the most have the most inefficient production of food, of, um, of food at this point. How did we get to where we are in the United States, let's say? and in many European countries. We have learned to use four main tools. We have improved reproduction of those animals. We have improved health care, so preventing disease and treating them. We have improved the genetics of plants and animals. And we have learned to feed more energy-dense diets. These four tools have allowed us to shrink the number of animals that we need to satisfy societal demands to historic lows. Never have we had fewer livestock and poultry than we do today to satisfy the nutritional needs of our societies. And I know the public perception is the opposite. The public thinks we've never had greater, larger herds of flocks, but that's inaccurate. I'll give you two examples, really quickly. Back in 1950, we used to have 25 million dairy cows in the United States. 25. Today, we have 9 million dairy cows. So we have cut our herd from 25 to 9 million, but we are producing 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. We went from 25 to 9, but we are producing 60% more milk. That means the carbon footprint of a gallon of milk has shrunk by two-thirds. The same is true for beef. Here you see how many animals were slaughtered over the years from 1970 until pretty much today. How many animals were slaughtered? You can see total slaughter numbers are pretty drastically down. But the amount of beef produced is going up at the same time. Okay, the slaughter numbers go down and production levels are going up. Many people say, well, we are eating way too much red meat. We are eating way too much beef. What this slide shows, I think very nicely, on the left, on the right, on the x-axis are the years 1909 to 2015. And on the y-axis you see total amount of of meat eating per person. What you see is that over the last 100 years, beef consumption in the United States has stayed stable. We are, produced, we are eating 0.6% more beef. We are eating 3% less total red meat, but in total we are still eating way more meat. But what it is that we are eating is poultry. 500% more chicken over the last 100 plus years. That's what we are increasing. Not beef, not pork, 500% more chicken. That's where it's going. And then last but not least, just one slide. There are many people who say we're eating way too much meat. Everybody hears this all the time. This is like a mantra that everybody seems to agree upon. I will now show you the actual data that the dietary guidelines of the US are suggesting we should eat versus what we actually do eat. Okay? What we should eat versus what we actually do eat. On this slide here you see that in 1960, the USDA estimated that we actually eat 5.8 ounces of meat. The dietary guideline says we should eat 5.5 ounces. So we should eat 5.8, we do eat 5.5, so approximately the same. But now see those two graphs here. On the left side you see males of different age groups, from little babies to old people. On the left side, males first, and then females following. The blue bars show the recommended range of what we eat with respect to protein. Okay? 
So we should eat from here to here. That's the range we should eat. And the dots show what we actually do eat. Now compare what we should eat versus what we do eat. And then you tell me where we are drastically overeating protein. To me, that seems like there are three age groups in one gender that are overeating protein. And that is middle-aged men. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. But you're the only ones who slightly overeat protein. Everybody else is not overeating protein, particularly not women. You can see most women are eating, consuming protein at the lower recommended levels. So it is not true that we are drastically overeating protein in this country. I know it's a mantra, I know the media talks about it all the time, but it does not conform with the actual data. By the way, the data here is from the NHAMES uh, study, which is pretty much the two-go study of any kind of nutritional scientist and dietitian that I know of. So with that, uh, I want to show this one slide to you and then I'm pretty much done. It shows on the x-axis the years 1948 to 2015. It shows farm inputs, so all the inputs that go into a farm being pretty stable from 1948 until today. But agriculture productivity, the amount of food produced, is going skyrocket high. We are going one way and one way only in how we produce food, and that is going up at a very, a very steep rate. And this, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, is the only way we can satisfy the 2050 challenge. There's no other. I mean, we can either shrink human population, and you tell me how we do that, or we find ways of improving productivity. And that's what we have done. This is my last slide. People ask me, can we eat our way out of climate change? So, if we were to assume that you are an omnivore, you eat everything today, and you now decide to go vegan for one year, for one year, in order to improve your environmental performance, then that move will, would reduce your carbon footprint by 0.8 tons of greenhouse gas footprint. 0.8 tons. One year of going vegan. If you fly from here in New York to Frankfurt, Germany, one flight, then that equates to 1.6 tons of CO2 equivalent. Meaning one flight from here to Europe equates to twice the amount of carbon uh, emissions than going vegan for one year. If the United States in total would go vegan as Monday, we would reduce the carbon footprint of our country by 0.3%. And if the entire country, 320 million Americans, would go vegan, we would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 2.6%. That to me is a pretty clear indication that we cannot keep our way, our way out of climate change. We have to be clear as to what the main challenges are. We have to play our role and we have done so in agriculture. And we will continue to do so. And your industry is actually a very important industry to play into the overall environmental performance of livestock. Because livestock is not just about meat and milk and eggs. It is also about, in the case of a beef steer, let's say, 400 total commodities. And one that's very important is euros, the leather commodity. So with that, I come to a close here. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions I might have. Thank you. Perceptions that we have on, on livestock and uh, for being so educational, so teaching us uh, about uh, about these uh, facts that are uh, determining our lives. So now that we that we understand that livestock is so important in our lives um, and that leather is actually participating in this economy that is so important in our, in our lives, I would like to to move right to the floor uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, we know each other for the last uh, uh, two decades at least, and that um, makes us not much younger. But uh, uh, Federico Brugnoli is, a, is, an, is an engineer, he is an innovator, he is an, he is an uh, uh, businessman. He has, uh, he has no. I remember 20 years ago we were chasing him for getting some information, for making him do things that. Now we don't find him anymore because he is so much researched by the leather industry, the paper industry, the automotive industry, and a lot of the luxury industry, a lot of sectors of the, of the economy that it is very hard to get uh, hold of him. 
but uh, uh, thanks that uh, he is uh, here with us today and he is going to talk us about innovation in the, in the industry. Federico is uh, the manager of uh, the Diabene Innovation Square, which is a, a, a new development in Diabene and that uh, presents uh, the future of our industry. What is, how innovative it is. And without any further ado, Federico, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you. factories will look like and then we'll go back to next year to see how leather looks like in 2020 and uh, we will try to see how it will look like in 2030. So as it has just been said, uh, we will have to face uh, some problems but there are some also good news in, uh, in 10 years from now. Uh, I, I would say that the, the best good news is that the child mortality will be Sense. Uh, at least this is what is, is forecasted. There will be a start of space tourism. Uh, of course, the world, uh, as we have heard, uh, already said, the earth is going to be overpopulated. There will be water scarcity, and therefore desalination will be a major technology and energy consuming the, the industry as well. 6G standard uh, is going to be released. Uh, we're going to start space tourism, but at the same time, uh, space, orbital space junk is going to be a problem because uh, of everything that we are satellites, etc., that we are sending up to uh, our uh, But more importantly, for probably the people in the room, um, half of US malls will be closed, will have closed. So there is also a radical change in the way uh, retail uh, will be, and this will be one of the uh, uh, most evident impacts uh, of, uh, that is closer to, to, to our industry. Uh, as a consequence of that, or as a consequence also of what we have been hearing before, for example, the, uh, the, the aging uh, of the population, uh, how the consumers uh, will, uh, will be featured. I just took examples of the data that are in several studies of uh, everybody that is looking about the, the new generation of consumers. But um, uh, consumer of, uh, of uh, 2030 will be old and active. Uh, So-called active aging is uh, uh, a feature that is affecting also product design, like for example, <laughs> footwear. Uh, uh, there, there, are, there is a, a clear trend toward comfort uh, in, in shoes, even in classical uh, in classical designs, um, uh, we will be urbanized. Uh, we were speaking about land use before. Uh, there will be an increase in the uh, surface of uh, cities. But if a consumer is urbanized, uh, it means that he's, I call that serviced. So that uh, uh, will be available. The consumers will have a lot of services. Uh, will be spoiled, probably not going out of uh, home that often. Uh, predominantly middle class, even if uh, well, the trend is called the rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, but the proportion of consumers that is going to be classified as Mr. middle class is going to be growing. Uh, focused on the health and wellness, and again, this is another topic that is heavily or predominantly influencing also the leather industry. Uh, I then call it empowered designer. So we are already seeing models in which uh, the consumers are not buying uh, objects, but uh, in particular in the interior design, they are buying drawings, 3D 
growing, that then can be manufactured or 3D printed uh, to be then delivered to the house of, uh, of consumers. Uh, we say experienced shoppers, particularly e-shoppers, uh, but uh, uh, consumers in, in 10 years from now will have learned how to shop better than now. Maybe advertising will be less important than it is now. And it's, uh, and, uh, the, inter the, use of index, the easy use of internet and the, let's say, predominantly, uh, the predominant uh, age uh, class of uh, those that are now the millennials, which, have, uh, which will have a bigger uh, purchasing power in the future, will bring us to a consumer that is uh, an experienced shopper, informed, conscious and selective. So that, uh, um, uh, again, probably the messages of advertising will drastically change, focusing more on brands rather than telling half lies on products. And, uh, of course, uh, the consumers will be 100% of the time uh, connected. If we look at the car 2030, Gustavo was mentioning that we are also involved uh, in, uh, in the automotive sector, yes we are. Uh, we are working with high level groups uh, in, the, in the European Commission uh, uh, in, in several projects. And we are analyzing the trends of the industry under a different angle because for us it is interesting to understand which are the skills that the automotive industry will require in the future. But these skills are very much linked with the product features. So that again I have selected some of the trends which are published in this report. For those of you who are interested, Year 2030, and is publicly available on the internet. Uh, and these features are that the car of the future are, uh, will be connected uh, with automated driving technologies. Will be mostly or uh, a larger, larger portion electrified. Um, <coughs> the research on alternatives to lithium batteries uh, gets to a proper direction. Uh, there will be uh, larger proportions of the car's components, including interiors that will be 3D printed. Uh, they will be using new and advanced materials in which weight is a key feature. Why weight is a key feature? Why, why weight is a key feature for you? What, what, is there any idea? Yeah? Because, they, exactly, because they will need to be efficient and will increase their age with the same amount of energy. So the automotive industry of the future will face the same problem that the, the, uh, the aircraft industry, the aerospace, uh, aerospace the airlines are, uh, are, are facing now. Um, and if we go back to leather as a material, of course lightweight leather is preferred in, in, in aircrafts, uh, but on cars it's not a problem yet. Uh, we have been speaking about uh, carbon footprint and environmental footprint, and I think that uh, if we speak about, well, it's not just that I think, I am speaking and I'm in touch with OEMs, uh, sustainability managers, that are, of course, telling me that uh, for them, zero emission vehicles is, is a key, uh, and if you want to, uh, to sell also a zero emission vehicle, you need uh, not zero, but close to zero emission materials. This is another problem why the importance of uh, environmental footprinting will be increasing also in the car industry in the future. And then uh, connected, and um, V2X means uh, vehicle to whatever else. So V2X to connectivity is another topic that will be of great interest uh, in, uh, in the future. And of course, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, mobility as a service. So uh, actually I have not been Starting it here in the US, but in Europe, the model of uh, uh, car sharing is growing and growing and growing in importance, and it will be growing also in the future, if in particular, if you consider the increasing number of people that will be urbanized, as we were saying before. So, uh, in, in Europe, we see this as a service that started by, as a public service, so maybe municipalities were like putting cars in the streets, but now we have Audi, we have BMW, and we have other. OEMs and uh, car building manufacturers that are starting their own uh, uh, fleet leasing services, let's say. So, okay, we'll be speaking about everything but leather. Uh, the last part is uh, how the factory of the future will look like, and here the source is uh, 
uh, another organization we work with is called Factories of the Future. It's a public-private partnership with the biggest manufacturers uh, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, just to take a reference and to make some provocations, which is my own today. So what are the factories of the future? The factories of the future will be digitalized and self-learning. So we, are, we hear a lot about uh, uh, industry for, for the fourth industrial revolution that will be in, uh, on uh, uh, digitalization. So in 10 years from now, the digitalization process will have ended. Not only that, the data that will be produced by digitalized machines will start to be using, used also through AI to optimize processes. So this is why we speak about digitalized and self-learning factors. Um, they will be connected, worldwide connected, in a collaborative manner. There are already examples of uh, co-designs of products, or in particular of, uh, of complex process, uh, products. The supply chains will be more and more transparent. Uh, I don't know, there was a speaker before speaking about Google, uh, yeah, who was you? Google um, uh, trying to measure the footprint of the fashion industry, while well, Google is also active in finding solutions to using through blockchain for traceability of materials, in particular for fashion. It's a very recent news. Factories of the future will be sustainable and urban. Uh, sustainable, the meaning is obvious, uh, less resource consuming uh, with uh, uh, a clear uh, direction of uh, uh, reusing uh, materials, uh, minimizing uh, the use of, uh, of resources. Urban, this is a little bit more curious, but we already have examples of uh, the so-called factories close to consumer or factories in shops, which is a very fascinating concept in my, in my, in my opinion, because it's also uh, the empowering technology for customization in our industry, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, another, another very curious and very tempting subject to go, to go through. Uh, and, uh, and this means that the, the production will need to move towards just in time, just in time, no stock. Uh, less, uh, less immobilization of, of running capital, money, uh, and uh, more efficient processes uh, through just in time technologies. Um, yeah, and it, th this one is uh, a concept that I kind of invented the day before yesterday. Bioorganical, so from chemical to bioorganical, it's uh, a trend, a clear trend of uh, evolution also in the production of uh, reagents and, uh, and, uh, and uh, chemistry uh, that are used in different factories that are starting to use uh, uh, biosynthesis and biofabrication to produce molecules that are then used in different products. Um, and then uh, cobotical means that. Uh, Robots will uh, uh, co to co a cobot is a collaborative robot. Okay, so it's a robot that interacts with humans, and uh, we see um, uh, if uh, if any of you have the pleasure and the luck to go into the new uh, R and D labs of big brands such as Gucci, for example, you see that the production also of very good in Italy is moving towards cobots, where humans are interacting with robots, increasing efficiency and standardizing. Okay, I've tried to be, you know, like looking at the future now, let's go back to Robert, and there's, uh, among all these features, uh, of course, everything that we said until now has an influence or has an impact on the features of materials, and we have to speak about what is leather now and what is the leather going to be in the future. Well, leather is resistant uh, and long-lasting and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and this is a feature that is influencing a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, in the topics we've been discussing uh, uh, before. And by the way, this is a micro, is a, is a picture of the microstructure of, uh, of, of leather for the many of you, including myself, who a few days ago who didn't know. Uh, leather is circular. Yeah, we've been saying about it, uh, I don't know how many times today, but let's make this concept very clear. It's the valorization of a byproduct of the meat industry, and therefore I was very scared to see the graph in which the slaughtering, where I mean, I'm wondering where the slaughtering gets to zero, because uh, if, uh, that is going to be a problem for the leather industry. Um, it is resource efficient, um, uh, 
uh, we have been already speaking about the amount, uh, uh, well, the reductions in the, in the use of uh, chemistry resources and energies that have been achieved. And you know why? Does any of you know why the lab industry is like so well performing in sustainability? Mm -hmm. In the past, long, long, long time ago, tunnels were outside the walls in the, in the medieval age in Europe. Tunnels were outside the walls of the cities because they were stinking. They were using dirty materials. Mm -hmm. And that has created a misconception and a very important factor that is the environmental pressure, the, pres the pressure on tunnels on environmental improvement. And this has created a side, the effect that the tunnels are one who started before other industries to go towards sustainability and sustainable models. Why? Because they had a lot of pressure from the public opinion from the very early stage. Just in time, we have examples, uh, I, I don't know about examples in Italy, but we have examples, uh, so in US, but in Italy we do have examples of companies who are investing in huge um, finished market stocks so that an order can be delivered in one day. There is no, no more need for five days lead time, five weeks lead time, uh, or tunnels are so well organized that they, they bring the semi-finished product down to the, the, the last moment in which the lead time is one week, so we can say that customization of products will need just-in-time materials that are a reality today. Well, on technical, uh, we, uh, we were uh, discussing about the different features, and I think uh, Mike also has, uh, um, uh, and uh, I was discussing in, in Boston last week uh, with, uh, with a student of uh, Wentworth Institute and said, no, I like authentical leather, meaning that that there still has that perception of being a material that has an authenticity. Uh, it is transparent. This is an example of a simplified model of a supply chain of, uh, of a simple production for leather goods, in which you see how many different actors are involved, uh, in which there are traders of live animals, in which there are different farms, in which these different farms are then selling to different slaughterhouses, then to different traders, and so on and so forth. So it is a very complex supply chain, but the industry is moving very much and very hard towards full transparency, going back to the farm. Uh, it is light. It is surprisingly light. Uh, if, we, if we measure the, the strength of the material compared with the, with the, the thickness, that leather is commonly already used in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the aerospace, let's say. It's easy to clean, as it has been said uh, before, and it's sustainable. Does, does this look like a tannery? It is a tannery in Italy, built two years ago. Is it a nice factory, in your opinion, or is it ugly? I think it looks good. Uh, but, it's, but it's still analogic, so we are working to improve on, the, on that. Amount of possibilities of uh, improvement using artificial intelligence for in process improvement is incredible because it's a stable substrate that uses chemistry and water to transport collagen. So this is a, a kind of pro a problem that the, the genius and the nerds like uh, very much to, to optimize through the through AI something that we didn't get there yet uh, with human intelligence. And then uh, letter 2030. Well, to, I can tell you that there are several topics in which we are doing, okay? And to understand, I invite you to come to Milano next October, October 2nd to October 4th. But uh, I can give you some uh, ideas. Basically, we, this year we will be speaking about six major topics. Fit for you, meaning customization. Uh, nanotech trends, we are called the on wearables, we are called that we are able, no? because basically wearable are enabling products to provide functions. And then the whole section of biogeneration, biofabrication, good. Uh, upcycle, upcycling, uh, and design for upcycling in particular, which is a topic that is of, uh, of uh, very high interest for myself. And then possibilities of providing new aesthetic uh, properties to the material. And these are just a very 
short examples of, of what you will be able to see. Uh, on the loop view, we have uh, LED embedded in, uh, in leather and, uh, and other materials as uh, uh, objects that are starting to communicate. 